So without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome our speaker today, Marshall Tannick. Um, local attorney and, um, dare I say, somewhat of a, a local celebrity as well. Uh, his, his bio is longer, truly, than we um, have time for. Um, probably we could have opened up with everybody sharing a little bit about their experience and the great things that he's done over time. What I'd like to do is I'm just going to turn the floor over to Mr. Tannock right now. Um, there were some articles that were mailed out ahead of time, um, along with this dissertation for your review. So without further ado, Marshall, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Uh, the screen is mine. Thank you very much, Michelle, and everybody else for inviting me back again. Uh, today's topic is one that uh, you really don't have to be a legal savant, not that I am one, but uh, everybody's got an opinion about this topic. And the general title of my presentation is A Cop Cases. Fair trial, where trial, or as a, as a uh, subtitle, can Derek Chauvin and his colleagues get a fair trial, and if so, where trial? And uh, this is, as I said, a, a subject that just about everybody has an opinion on because everybody has been a witness to what happens. We have a situation here where everybody in the world has seen uh, the events that uh, are going to be portrayed in the courtroom pretty soon. You've probably seen them multiple times. So um, what I thought I'd do is provide a little bit of a legal backdrop for some of the issues that we're going to see unfold in front of us over the next few months. Some of them have already unfolded in terms of the trial of these police officers and give you a little bit of a backdrop because as you follow what happens in the courtroom, uh, I think it'll be useful to have a little bit of context from a legal standpoint of how the judges and lawyers and other participants in the process might be addressing some of these issues of fair trial and where trial. Um, uh, I, I do uh, encourage and want as much uh, input and questions and answers and your own thoughts as possible. So I'm going to leave lots of time at the end here. I'll leave at least 10 or 15 minutes at the end and maybe more to talk about some of these issues and get your input and opinions uh, as well. Uh, but I want to start by tracing the history of this whole concept of fair trial and prejudicial publicity and can defendants get fair trials in highly sensational, highly volatile cases. The history goes back a little over half a century and it goes back to the day uh, to a famous case known as the Dr. Sam Shepard case. Many of you have heard about Dr. Sam Shepard and, and may have read about it. Dr. Sam Shepard and this happened in the 1950s, 1954, actually. Dr. Sam Shepard was an osteopath in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, his wife was murdered in the middle of, a ni of the night one evening. Uh, and uh, suspicion fell on, she, she was murdered in her home, strangled in her home. Suspicion fell on Shepard, who was the only one in the uh, house at the time. Shepard said that the, that the uh, murder was committed by an intruder, a bushy-haired stranger. And uh, that didn't wash too well. This was well before the, we had high, uh, very much forensics at all. Fingerprinting was about all they had there, and fingerprinting wasn't helpful. Uh, and there was really not much evidence, if any, as to who committed this murder, other than Shepard was there in the house at the time. And there was very little indication that there was any intruder or that anybody else had uh, committed the offense. The Cleveland newspapers of the time, and this was the era when newspapers were the major me medium in the mid-1950s, although television was playing a role, were hammering and harping at uh, Shepard as being the uh, murderer and uh, were um, running daily articles on the front pages of their newspapers, imploring the police and the law enforcement officials to arrest and try and convict Shepard even before he had been charged with any offenses. The Cleveland Plain Dealer, which was the major newspaper in the community at that time, uh, ran a front page article, uh, editorial actually, a front page editorial that uh, under the headline of, why isn't Dr. Sam in jail, question mark. And that was the kind of media frenzy that took place then. It was uh, somewhat comparable to what we saw 40 years later with uh, O.J. Simpson and the uh, Bronco Drive. I mean, everybody, at least in that community, was uh, up in arms about this, and it was a highly, highly sensationalized murder case. Ultimately, Shepard was try uh, charged with murder. He was tried and convicted by a jury in Cleveland. Um, that he, he appealed that case to, to many different uh, court, appellate courts, and ultimately the case reached the United States Supreme Court in 1966, uh, 12 years after the murder had occurred. 
Shepard's claim in the case was not that he was innocent, although he denied he denied being the murderer. But he, he, when it reached the Supreme Court, the issue wasn't his guilt or innocence. The issue was whether he was deprived of a fair trial because of the media frenzy that accompanied the case. Not only was there a great deal of pre, prejudicial uh, pr publicity about the case before the case, but during the case itself, the the newspapers and television and radio stations and were all crowding in the courtroom and interviewing people and uh, witnesses and interviewing jurors and engaging in the kind of behavior that um, Shepard maintained uh, prevented him from getting a fair trial. It's a little bit like some of you may have seen the old newsreels of the famous uh, 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 Bruno Hopman uh, Glimber kidnapping case when there's crowds outside the courtroom and they're selling souvenirs and vendors are there and there's uh, uh, television, not television, those days, radio wires strung all over the courthouse. That kind of thing was pervasive in this Shepard case, too, in Cleveland. So the argument made by Shepard and his lawyer was that he was deprived of a fair trial because there was so much prejudicial publicity before and during the trial that it made it a mockery of justice. Uh, the Supreme Court agreed with Shepard. The Supreme Court, in a famous phrase, said that the trial was conducted in a, quote, circus atmosphere. And it referred to the trial being, they said the trial should be a matter of uh, dispensing justice, not engaging in a carnival. So the court used some very strong language to condemn the kind of uh, behavior that had been taking place in and around that case. They reversed the case and sent it back for a new trial. Shepard's lawyer at that time was a young lawyer that no one had ever heard of before, but they would hear of him in that case and in much later cases, in high profile cases. His name was F. Lee Bailey, and that's how he made his name, getting Shepard's trial reversed, you know, conviction reversed. Shepard then was retried and he was acquitted by a jury 15 years after the event had happened. So Shepard was a free man. Shepard, Dr. Sam, instantly went on to become a Kind of a B, uh, thank you for referring to me as a celebrity, Michelle. I think I'm a C-level uh, celebrity at best. But Shepard was kind of a B-minus celebrity. He appeared on some of the talk shows of his day. And yeah, he did a book uh, back in the 60s, the early 70s. Uh, he uh, never went back to osteopathy, but his next career was that of a professional wrestler. And he, uh, as I said, was kind of a B-minus level celebrity until the time of his death uh, in the late, uh, late 1990s. The Shepard case made history, though, legal history, because it was the first time the Supreme Court had ever, it was the first time the Supreme Court, or any court for that matter, had reversed a, a conviction based on the uh, claim that the defendant couldn't get a fair trial because of publicity and the celebrity nature of the case and the, and the fact that, that the case was tried in such a frenzy. The Supreme Court had a couple of other cases right after Shepard when it likewise reversed cases because of prejudicial publicity. And so there was a string of cases that followed Shepard. And by the end of the 1960s and early 1970s, the law was fairly well established that trial judges have an obligation and duty to make sure that to the best of their ability, they prevent this kind of media frenzy from occurring and also make sure that uh, the, in criminal, high level, high profile criminal cases, that jurors are selected that can be fair and unbiased and neutral. Uh, another example of that principle was another very high profile case, Jack Ruby the man who slayed Lee Harvey Oswald in the basement of the Dallas Police uh, uh, Department on, no on Sunday, November 24th, 1963. And that case has some similarities to the current cases because that was li live on television and uh, everybody saw it that Sunday morning. If they didn't see it live, they certainly have seen replays of it. They're still running it. So everybody saw Ruby shoot and kill Oswald. And the question was whether he could get a fair trial. He was ultimately charged and convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to death in Dallas, Texas. His trial took place three blocks away from where his, the murder occurred. Uh, that case was reversed as well because the court determined that Ruby couldn't get a fair trial with those jurors and that high sensationalized a case in Dallas, Texas. Ruby was about to be retried for that event uh, when he died of cancer uh, a few eight days before his new trial. So Ruby died a free man, not a free man, he was still in jail, but he died a, an innocent a man in the eyes of the law. Just recently, we saw another situation where a high level uh, 
high profile case was reversed because of unfair jury bias. And that was a case involving one of the Boston Marathon bombers, one of the Zigniew brothers. Um, and this was just last month, the end of August, the uh, federal, federal court reversed the death sentence imposed upon one of the two Boston uh, uh, marathon bombers. His brother, the, kind of the, the, the leader of the, of the group, uh, died in a shootout, as you recall, but the younger brother went to trial and was convicted and sentenced to death under federal law. Massachusetts doesn't have a death penalty, but federal law, he was sentenced under the terrorism law to death uh, for his role in the Boston um, marathon bombing. Um, the uh, finally, uh, not finally, but ultimately last week, no, last month, the uh, federal appellate court reversed the death sentence. They didn't reverse the verdict that he's guilty, but they reversed the death sentence on the grounds that the judge had not properly weeded out jurors who had either some impression of the case or had some bias or were uh, otherwise not neutral, fair jurors. There were two jurors in particular that the court was concerned about. One juror was conducting a um, uh, 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 during the during the course of the trial, the, that juror was going on his Facebook page and posting uh, uh, his impressions of the case on a daily basis and kind of giving a running narrative of the case. Another juror also went on Facebook and gave his opinions about the case during the course of the jury deliberations. And the ju the court said that's that, that's a no no. That's verboten. And this man's entitled to a new trial only as to his sentence, not as to his guilt. But, but and of course that was an event that uh, everybody there knew about. Everybody had seen the event or seen the aftermath of the event, it was very difficult to pick a jury that would not would be neutral. And in that case, the judge was unable to do so. And the court admonished the judge in that case, the appellate court admonished the judge for not ferreting out these jurors and not doing a better job of questioning and vetting the jurors and kind of blamed the judge for letting that case get out of control, at least at the sentencing level. Uh, so those are some of the kind of legal developments in the backdrop of the question of fair, can a, can a defendant in a high profile case get a fair trial? Incidentally, back to the Sam Shepard case, the Sam Shepard case was the prototype or the model for a, uh, a very well-known series of fictional portrayals of that case. Anyone know what that, what that was? A tele, there was a long running television series, a very highly rated one. It was the top 10 every year. Go ahead. The Fugitive. The Fugitive. Remember that? No, you're all too young for that. Just the old timers like me remember that. Starring? David Jansen. J-A-N-S-S-E-N. -S -S -E David Jansen starred for nine years in The Fugitive. Every year it was on. It was in the top 10 uh, in ratings. Uh, and that was, he was a doctor, like Shepard, whose wife was killed, and, uh, and he was convicted of it. And uh, he maintained that the real killer was a, a one-armed man and the whole series was him trying to find he escaped from a well he wasn't in prison remember they he escaped because he was a, there was a train accident on the way to prison so he escapes and the whole story has him on the lamb for nine years during the cd series and nine years of running on the lamb trying to find the one-armed man and ultimately they did in the final final series the fi final show and that that's that's but the fugitive was modeled after the sam shepherd case as was the 1993 movie entitled the fugitive starring it's a big time movie big time stars harrison ford, harrison ford. thank you i'm glad you showed Tommy up Tommy lee jones seal award there you go yeah yeah that was a big movie it was a high budget movie and it did very well at the box office and it did also very well in among the critics uh, it was a good movie. Um, and Harrison Ford, same story, doctor killed his wife, allegedly killed his wife, escapes, doesn't get to jail, spends the time trying to find the real killer and does. Tommy Lee Jones uh, won an Academy Award for his portrayal of the U.S. Marshal who was uh, on his trail in that case. Um, so it was, a, it, was, it was a good movie, Not, uh, The Fugitive, starring uh, Harrison Ford, Tommy Lee Jones. And who else? Someone else was in there too. Who else? The, who was the woman lead in that? Cela Ward. That's right. Yeah, Seal Award. That's right. So it's a good movie. And you can find it on Netflix just about any night you want. Um, speaking of finding the real killer, uh, much of our concept about fair trial and publicity these days stems from the O.J. Simpson case, which I referred to earlier. Uh, and that's another example of just a, a, such a high profile case where at, at first blush, one would say, well, how can you ever find fair jurors or unbiased jurors for a case like that? And maybe they didn't. Maybe they didn't. Um, uh, interestingly, in the O.J. Simpson murder case, the trial took place in downtown Los Angeles because the L.A. 
the LA uh, district attorney's office had a policy back then, which they subsequently changed of the trial takes place wherever in the district where the booking, where the, where the person is booked into jail. Simpson was brought downtown to the LA downtown jail and that's where he was booked in, even though the murder occurred in Brentwood way out in you know, a, a much fancy a posh area of Los Angeles. The reason that's significant is because the jury pool as we all saw in central LA consisted primarily of minorities and there were eight blacks on the jury. Had that case, so the, in the um, district attorney took a lot of heat for trying that case there, but after the fact they said that case should have been tried out in Brentwood. Where, where Simpson's civil case was tried. And as you recall, in the civil case, he was found liable, not guilty, but liable, lower standard of proof. But nevertheless, the civil case was tried before a largely white jury in the basically the LA suburbs. And, um, uh, but the, the criminal case was tried uh, right in the, in the center of the city there with a, a large minority jury population. That's significant because we're gonna talk about that in a few minutes about in terms of the demographics of the jury. But, um, uh, the Simpson case is an example of the either difficulty, the difficulty that at least is presented in trying to pick a jury when uh, the event is so prominent that everybody knows about it. In the Chauvin case, and I'll refer to the Chauvin case, although there's four officers, in the Chauvin case, not only does everyone know about it, everybody saw it. In fact, many people in, in any jury pool, maybe most people in any jury pool, are going to, when they're asked, have you seen the incident? They'll say, yeah, I did, because just about everybody saw it. And many people have seen it a number of times. So it raises a, a number of concerns about how to get a fair jury and can a fair jury be had in that case? Well, there's a number of devices that courts have, judges and lawyers have, to try to assure that a fair trial can be had with a fair jury. I just wanna tick off a few of these because I think you're gonna be hearing and seeing some of these in play during this case. In fact, some of them have already been utilized. One is gag orders. A gag order, as you know, is a directive by the court, a judge, not to talk about the case. And, the, and now gag orders are, are utilized in extreme circumstances because of the First Amendment and freedom of speech and the judges don't like to tell people they can't talk. In uh, gag orders generally can only be used as to the parties themselves, the litigants and their lawyers. You can't have a blanket gag order preventing anybody from talking about it, but you can per 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 try to prevent the participants from talking about the case. And in this case, there was a gag order entered by Judge Cahill, the uh, judge who's hearing the case in Hennepin County. He did enter a gag order directed to the lawyers in the case saying they cannot talk about the case other than in the courtroom. They can't talk to the media about it. That gag order lasted a couple of days before the judge discarded it because he recognized the defense, defendants argued that, hey, the prosecution's been out here making all kinds of statements. The elected officials, the mayor, the governor, the police chief have all condemned the police officers as being murderers and killers and guilty. And we have to fight back and get our view across. And we are entitled to tell the media what our view is because we're just playing catch up here, the defendant said. And ultimately the judge agreed and after 48 hours he lifted the gag order, so that didn't work. But there was another form of gag order that was entered in that case too. The media, which always opposes these kind of restrictions on what can be reported, wanted to see the body camera, uh, body camera videos from the, very, from the four officers, uh, which, the state, which the prosecution had. The judge refused to allow, the judge said the defendants can see the body camera. They have to see that to defend themselves, but the media cannot see that body camera because the judge was concerned that if the media saw it, they'd report about it and it may taint the ultimate jury pool. So the judge entered a ruling that restricted, um, that prevented the body, the media from getting access to the body camera video uh, information. While the media brought, uh, the, the media, uh, uh, brought in a motion to try to restrict it, to lift that gag order, and the judge ultimately agreed that, the media, that representatives of the media, newspapers, television stations, representatives of only the media could come in in a locked room and see the body camera video themselves and report on it. They couldn't take, make copies of it. They couldn't show it to anyone else. They, couldn't, they could write about it and just the media. Well, that lasted about two days too. Remember the Guardian newspaper, British newspaper, it has American circulation. The Guardian newspaper somehow got a hold of the body camera video and showed it on its website. 
And since the cat was out of the bag, the judge threw up his hands and said, well, I guess I can't stop this now either. So now it's open season. Anyone can go down there and see the body camera. You have to make a reservation ahead of time. But these days, you got to make a reservation to do anything. But if you make a reservation and go down there, you can see the body camera video. In fact, every potential juror in the state could do that if they wanted to. They won't. They won't. But anybody can see the body camera video, which is pretty unusual because you usually don't have cases in which the public at large sees the evidence before the case is presented in trial. In fact, there's legal restrictions on that. Generally, evidence in a case is not to be uh, uh, displayed to the public until there's an actual trial. But in this case, the evidence is all out there for anybody to see because there's been such a voracious demand for it. So the gag orders haven't worked here too well. They haven't worked at all. Another device that courts use sometimes to, mill it, to, to uh, mitigate against prejudice and try to have a, 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 an unbiased jury is to have what's called severance of trials. Severance is a um, terminology that, that's used in criminal cases when the defendants are tried separately. Right now, all four of the defendants are being tried to, are in the same case. And oftentimes, defendants will want to separate themselves from other defendants and be tried separately. For instance, you can well imagine that in this case, the Chauvin case, some or all of the other officers might not want to be sitting at the same table with Chauvin. They might want to be tried separately in their own separate case without having Chauvin as a participant or having even the video showing Chauvin there at all. So the defendants may want to be uh, tried separately and they would ask the judge to separate their cases. Each of them could ask for a separate trial and you could have four different trials. I'm not saying it'll happen, but they could. On the other hand, strategically, some of the defendants might say, you know what, maybe I would, wouldn't mind being tried with Chauvin. He looks so much guiltier than me, maybe by comparison, a jury is going to be more lenient to me if I'm in the same case with him. So there's some strategic and tactical decisions there. But at any rate, the prosecution has tried to address those by, by preempting the, that, uh, the, those efforts because the prosecution has, bring, has brought a motion to have all the cases tried together and, try, and, and wants the judge to rule on that soon so to prevent separate trials. Whether that happens or not, we don't know. Another device, and probably the most prominent device that's used by uh, courts in trying to ferret out jurors and have a fair trial is what's called voir dire. Um, voir dire, as you know, is a, it's a French word that means please tell, tell us, um, tell us please. And it's a process by which lawyers and judges question prospective jurors to see who's going to be on the jury and who's not. And you've all seen it on TV and in the movies. And maybe some of you have been subjected to it. Anyone here been a juror who's gone through a voir dire and lawyers question you? Well, the, the lawyers will generally, in federal court, the judges do all the questioning, but in state court, the, the, ju the lawyers do all the questioning. And, they'll, and what they're trying to do is find jurors that are fair. They always tell the jurors, we're just asking these questions to find fair and neutral and unbiased jurors, but they're not. They're trying to find jurors who are going to be favorable to their position. And they'll ask a number of seemingly innocuous questions. What magazines do you read? What television shows do you watch? What are your hobbies? And uh, depending upon what answers they get, uh, they may determine that jurors are leaning one way or the other. And, and in this case, they'll probably use jury consultants to help them on that. But there's certain tendencies that jurors have. Prosecution, and the prosecution likewise is going to want jurors that tend to favor them. Uh, uh, jurors who tend to hunt and fish are going to probably have a different outlook on cases than jurors who have pastimes of reading and knitting. And lawyers know that, and it's a time-honored tradition for lawyers to try to pick the jurors that they think are going to be most sympathetic to their position and not the other position. And each side has the ability to, to remove some jurors from the jury from the jury pool, but not all juries. And in this case, there'll probably be 16 to 18 jurors selected. There has to be 12 to, to hear the case, but there'll be alternates. So they'll probably go through 50 or 60 people before they can pick a dozen or 15 or 18 jurors that they think will be fair and impartial. And, and, and there's often trade-offs because sometimes the prosecution will say, well, we'll keep some people on the jury that we may not like, but the other side has to keep some that they don't like either. Um, and ultimately you get a melding of jurors and hopefully you get a fair and unbiased pool of jurors. The fact that a juror has heard about a case and even the fact that a juror has an impression about a case or even an opinion about a case does not necessarily preclude someone from being on a jury. 
especially in a difficult case like this where everybody has seen it and may even already have opinions and impressions. The ultimate question is, can this person be a fair juror, notwithstanding the fact that they may have heard about the incident, they may have seen the incident, and they may even have some opinions and impressions. And the jurors themselves play a role in their own self-selection. If someone wants to be on a jury, there are certain buzzwords that they will say or can say that's, more li- that's going to make it more likely that they will be on a jury. For instance, if a juror says, well, I can put aside any opinions and prejudice I have and I can judge this case fairly, well, they're probably going to pass, uh, pass at least that obstacle. On the other hand, if someone doesn't want to be on a jury, there's an easy way out. The way out is to say, I've already made up my mind. I don't think I can be fair. If a juror says that he or she cannot be fair, they're going to be whisked out of that courtroom and say, thank you very much. Uh, here's, your, here's, your, uh, here's a bus pass. Go home. Or go downstairs to the jury room or upstairs, actually. They have the jury room upstairs in Hennepin County now. So jurors can kind of decide, help decide whether they're on the jury or not by how they answer the questions. Um, uh, another technique that's also sometimes used to, fair, to prevent unfair prejudice in the jury is sequestration. It's pretty rare. Sequestration is when the jurors are kept together during the trial. They're put up in a hotel and they can't read newspapers or watch television and they can't see their family and, uh, uh, and uh, they're, they're, they're locked up together. That, the Simpson case had sequestered, a sequestered jury. Um, generally, it's anathema because jurors don't want to be sequestered, they, especially these days with COVID and all bets are off now with COVID. I think it's very unlikely that they're going to, you know, sequester the jury in this case. Um, but those are some devices that courts can use to try to maximize the likelihood of having unbiased, neutral, uh, fair jurors. Some of them work, some of them don't, but they're all devices that are available to courts to try to minimize the likelihood of prejudice on the part of a jury. But a big question in this case is what jury, or, or put another way, where is the jury going to be? Under the United States Constitution, as well as the Constitution of the State of Minnesota, a criminal defendant has a right to be tried in the locality where the crime allegedly occurred. That's here, Hennepin County. And that's where the case is lodged. However, both sides, prosecution and defense, can ask for a change of venue. They, the defendants have intimated that they're going to ask for a change of venue, but none has yet done so. It's a little bit early in the game to do that because usually the change of venue decisions aren't made until later in the case. Often the, the, the party seeking a change of venue will bring in surveys. They may hire consultants to go out and take uh, public opinion polls. They will present uh, a, a litany of uh, newspaper articles and television videos about the case to try to convince the judge, if they want the case moved, that the case should not be tried here because of prejudice. And surveys can be helpful. I had one case where we, uh, a, a, a case in a small town, it was a high profile case in a small town a number of years ago in which everybody in that small town knew about the case. And we hired a consultant who did a survey of some people in that town and in another town. And it was helpful in in trying to get that case, the venue in that case moved to a different locality. Ultimately, the judge denied our motion, but it did have an effect, I think, in leavening out the jury pool. And we ultimately won the case, even though the the venue had not been changed. But we used a, a survey to show the prejudice in that community. And I think that'll probably be done here. The prosecution also can ask for a change of venue, but they won't. The prosecution has already said they want this case tried here. Um, the uh, demographics obviously play a big role in that. Um, if the case is tried in Hennepin County, there undoubtedly will be a large minority population, people of color on that jury. How many, I don't know. But generally speaking, because of the way jurors are selected in, in Hennepin County, uh, to their credit, uh, diversity is a, a significant factor. And in most cases, at least a quarter of the, of the jurors or more are going to be people of color. Well, for pretty obvious reasons in a case like this, I would suspect that the defendants would pre- prefer to have a, a jury that has few, if any, pre- people of color uh, on the jury, while the prosecution would like to have people of color on the jury. So that's a, a not so a surprising tactical consideration that will come into play. If the case is tried somewhere else, there's probably going to be, depending upon where it's tried, fewer people of color on the jury and fewer minorities and, uh, on the jury. So the defendants may seek to change the venue, but the question is where 
Um, in, in federal court, you can change venue any place in the country. Remember the Oklahoma City bombing, um, uh, um, the, Timothy McVeigh, the bombing occurred in Oklahoma City. The case was tried in Denver because the, the atmosphere in Oklahoma City prevented a fair trial. So the case was tried in Denver. Can't do that in state court. We can't move the case from Minnesota to some other place. And even if you can, I'm not sure where you'd move it anyway, where people haven't already heard about this offense. But Minneapolis poses a problem because so many of the jurors have either been to the site or know someone who's been to the site. And even though it's a big community, um, Hennepin County is, uh, the likelihood of being a jur prospective jurors having some connection to the case one way or the other is high. If the case is moved to another locality, that, that, that likelihood is diminished, although not eroded, because everybody has seen the case. And people have said, well, how can you have a fair trial in any place? Everybody has seen the video. Well, that's true. But generally speaking, um, the defendants would like to have the case tried in another community where the people aren't so impacted by the result. But where? Um, it, 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 the, if the case is tried in another city in Minnesota, um, at least a city of, si of, of decent size, a reasonable size, there's minority populations in St. Cloud and Mankato and Duluth and uh, Rochester. So there may, that may be a, pose an issue as well. Um, the defendants might want to have the case tried in a relatively small community, let's say Morris, Minnesota, or Thief River Falls, or someplace where there's um, very few minority uh, residents. However, there's a logistic problem too. If the case is tried somewhere else, it has to, it should be in a place that's convenient to the folks who want to attend it. The, the advocates for Mr. Floyd and his family are going to want to be able to attend the trial. And likewise, family members, friends, advocates for the police officers are going to want to be able to attend the trial. So moving it up to International Falls for six weeks may not be very conducive or convenient to the people who have a right and entitled to be at the trial. Another consideration is the media. Wherever that, if that case is to be tried somewhere outside of the Twin Cities, it has to be in a city that's big enough to accommodate what's going to be a crush of international media. And there's going to have to be sufficient facilities uh, to uh, accommodate the people who are going to want to come and see that trial. It's going to have to be not just a big enough courtroom, but there has to be a accommodations, hotel and motel accommodations in the community. It'll be a big economic boon if it's in some other community, but um, that consideration has to be taken into account. As I said, there has been no request yet for a change of venue, but it probably is going to be forthcoming. And uh, we'll just have to see how that plays out. But there's all kinds of permutations here. It could be that some of the defendants ask for a change of venue and a separate trials. It may be that other defendants don't ask for a change of venue and want to be tried together. There may have to be four separate trials in four separate communities, or there may be one trial in one community or a couple of trials in different communities. So there's all kinds of different permutations that may occur here, and we'll have to see how that plays out. Now, the case is currently scheduled for some time in March, but I think it's unlikely that that case will get to trial that quickly. As we know, the incident occurred on Memorial Day in late May, and having a, a trial of this nature within 10 months is pretty quick. The, the Noor case, the Mohammed Noor case, the shooting of Justine Damon, that took almost a year and a half until that went to trial from the time of the incident. So it's not unusual for there to be more than a year to pass until the time of trial. So I would say if you're a betting person, um, take, uh, take the over on, on, on March because I don't think the trial will take place in March. I think it's more likely to take place in the summer. And I think the Chamber of Commerce would welcome the summer trial here too. I think they'd be a little bit concerned about having a trial in the dead of winter here and having a, a bad weather here that uh, the international media reports about. It'll remind people that it gets cold in Minnesota in the winter if they didn't recognize that already. Um, there also is other litigation going on. The criminal case is the, is the main case, but there also is a civil case. The, the, fam, the Floyd family has filed a civil lawsuit, and that's in federal court. You may have read about that yesterday uh, in the newspaper. Judge Susan Nelson of the federal court has been assigned the civil case. That civil case, which is only for damages, not criminal liability, uh, is brought by the family against the city and the four officers. That case is currently held in abeyance until the, for at least a couple of months and will probably be frozen until the criminal case is over if and when it ends. And depending upon the outcome of the criminal case, then the civil case will uh, address uh, financial liability issues uh, that may be separate and distinct from the criminal case. So there's a lot to uh, watch for and wait for as the months uh, unfold here in, the, uh, in this case. 
Uh, and uh, there's no easy answers to the question of can the cops get a fair trial and, and also where can they get a fair trial? But those are some of the legal issues that I think we'll all be uh, seeing in the months ahead. I don't have any strong opinions one way or the other, but I suspect people do, and I'd like to hear what their questions and thoughts and opinions are. Thank you. Thank you. So let's open the floor for questions. I have a couple of them. Um, first, based on the reversal of the sentence in the Boston Massacre case, uh, can convictions stand based on video and eyewitnesses despite frenzied media coverage and publicity using quote unquote murder of George Floyd? Well, the video certainly can be used, uh, Peggy. I mean, the video is the case there. Without the video, there may not be a case. And we've seen that in so many of these other cases. The video is the case. Uh, uh, so the video will be used as evidence. The, 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 to the extent that the video may taint the jury, well, that's the problem that the judge and the lawyers have to address. Is this jury so tainted because of that video that everybody has seen that they can't find at 12 people to be fair and neutral jurors? If that's the case, and this has been suggested by one of, by, by some commentators, it may be so difficult, if not impossible, to find a fair jury that the consequence of not being able to find a fair jury any place is no trial. No trial means the defendants uh, aren't, uh, aren't char are, 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 the charges are dropped and they, the, 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 the legal system walks away from this because they can't have a fair trial. I think it's highly unlikely that that would happen, but um, uh, th there's going to have to be a, you know, the, the jurors are going to have to be selected in a way uh, to find fair and neutral juries. It is possible, as the Boston case shows, that you can have two different juries. You have a jury to decide the crimin criminality, the guilt or innocence, and you can have a separate jury decide uh, other issues like sentencing. That probably isn't going to be an issue here because we don't have the death sentence. The reason the Boston case came out that way is in federal court, for, under the Federal Terrorism Act, you have a death sentence, so the jury has to decide whether the death sentence is to be imposed or not. In Minnesota and most states, except Texas, among others, juries don't decide sentencing. So the jury, uh, so the jury here will just decide guilt or innocence. So I think some of the Boston issues aren't, are, are going to be um, not applicable in this particular case. Okay, I have a second Call question. Oops, can I ask my second question? <laughs> Oops. Sorry. Sure, go ahead. Uh, is it possible to uh, allow only U.S. media to see something like body cam video since the government? No. Well, it's possible, but uh, it, it, nope. The answer is no. No, you can't. They, they can't discriminate against U.S. media versus Canadian media versus uh, Bulgarian media. I mean, the media is the media. In fact, what the judge ran into in that case, and I saw this coming, uh, is when he restricted it only to the media to see the body camera, the red flags went up and said, wait a minute, why does the media get special privilege? If the media, if someone can say, I'm a reporter for a newspaper, or I'm a or, or, uh, why should I be able to see the blog, uh, the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the video camera, a video uh, body camera, and, and someone else can't. Everybody has the same rights. Now, as a matter of convenience, I can see why you say, well, the media covers more people and we can't have 100,000 people coming in to look at it, but everybody has the same rights as the media, and that was a trip, tripping trip up for the, in that case when the judge said only the media can see it. The media rushed in and said, well, if we can see it, everybody should see it. And now that's why it's open season. And all you have to do is call down to the courthouse and you can go see it yourself. So the, the, as a practical and legal matter, the courts can't distinguish between who can see the video and who not based on their nationality or where they're from, or say, well, local media can see it, but you can't see it if you're from a different state. It's not going to work. It's all or nothing, which is part of the problem. But apparently they didn't come under U.S. law. Well, they don't have to come under the U.S. law. They're entitled to, I mean, I, 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 they, they have media representatives here. And all they have to do is have a reporter here who's working here and they're covered by the First Amendment. Whether, no, I don't think that's going to wash. To, it's, it, anyway, the, 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 that train's left the station. They've already allowed anybody who wants to see it, see it. Um, and I don't think there's going to be any restrictions on media coverage. There could be some restrictions on who gets 
passes into the courthouse and the courtroom and who can sit there and who not uh, versus sitting in a different room and watching on a video. But that's a matter of convenience. That's like any other event. Not everybody can get a uh, press pass to go watch an event. So they can make restrictions saying, well, we're going to give more press credentials to American media and state media compared to other media. But nevertheless, they have to let everybody have an equal opportunity to uh, view the evidence in a case like that, whether they're local or national or international, in my judgment. Anybody else? Yeah, Marshall, it's, um, we're, we're in a new era where people are using their, their iPhones, their, their cell phones to take pictures and do videotapes. And it's, it's a new form of evidence gathering, I guess, um, that isn't much unlike eyewitnesses in the past. And the, the, the issue is the credibility of some of these um, media postings. Yeah, well, eyewitness testimony has been you know, the, 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 the foundation of most criminal trials for years and years. There's been a lot of concern and questions raised about the accuracy and validity of eyewitness testimony, especially cross-racial identity and uh, uh, witnesses of one race not being able to discern uh, identities of uh, people of other races, and there have been all kinds of studies about that. And eyewitness testimony is somewhat suspect, and therefore the best evidence is usually documentary evidence, and documentary evidence extends to video. So these cases are video cases. I mean, th th this case is going to not just, it's not going to re result solely on the video, but there's not going to be much, dis well, there might be a little bit of dispute, but the video is going to show what happened from different angles, and then it's going to be incumbent on the other parties to explain what ha why it happened, and what their thinking was, and what their thought processes were. But the video are fair game and uh, almost all these cases these days not all of them but so many of these cases these days have a video component to them because everybody as you said brian has a cell phone and there's usually people around and how many how many of these instances since george floyd how many instances have we seen including the rochester incident last week and the atlanta shooting a, uh, a couple of months ago and ones that are surfacing from the past, the Denver situation that, that happened in the winter, but now surfacing. So it, 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 it is a little bit astonishing to see, geez, it seems like every one of these arrests, every one of these encounters, someone videoed it. And uh, that becomes prime evidence. Now, you know, questions can be raised as to the accuracy of the videos and whether it's doctored or not, but that'll be, that'll be uh, played out in the trial. Now, that's, it's an interesting issue that you raised, Brian, because here, as we know, there's different angles, there's different body cams. Some body cams show different things going on. Um, so uh, the, the old saying, a picture doesn't lie, isn't necessarily true. Uh, in this case, we're probably going to have five or six different versions of what happened. Right, right. Well, let me ask a question, pose a question. You don't have to answer this if you don't want to. Put your heads down, everyone, and raise your hand. But how many, how many people think that it's, you know, that there's a reasonable likelihood that a fair trial can be had for some or all of these officers in Hennepin County? And you define what you think is a fair trial. How many people think that it's, uh, you know, feasible that there can be a reasonably fair trial and justice can be served for a, a fair trial for both sides, the prosecution and the defense? Or let me ask it the other way. <laughs> how many people think it can't be? I mean, at least in Hennepin County, how many people have the view that, uh, we're not experts here, but how many people are the view that, geez, there could be a, there should be a trial here, but it can't be in Hennepin County. It's just going to be too difficult to have a case in Hennepin County. It's just going to be too difficult to pick jurors. Everybody's going to have some connection to the case one way or the other. And maybe it's best to have this case out in some area where it's less likely to be tainted by those kind of influences. Is there anyone who, you know, is there anyone who feels that way or doesn't feel that way or wants to offer an opinion about that? Well, I think it's a whole new ball game now because we we're treating any video, cell phone video as a document. So the, the issue is the veracity of the document and if there's any bias in the document. Um, I, I hate to play the devil's advocate in this because I would not be on that jury. <laughs> but um, um, part of the argument was that um, uh, George Floyd um, was under some kind of drug-induced um, hysteria. And um, I think that's going to be a big part of the argument for the Oh, yeah. The causation issue is a major issue in this case. As we all know, the original coroner's report uh, referred to, you know, the, uh, the, the death not being caused by 
by, by the officer. So that's going to be a major issue in this case, just like in the OJ case that uh, we're going to have, probably have some, some competing and very, and maybe some high profile forensic types. We're going to come in and testify as to causation of death and the like. So I think we're going to see that too, beyond the video. I think the, the you know, I, I, there'll be a, a lot of issues. And of course there's different issues as to different officers. And, you know, one officer is going to have, the officers are going to have different perspectives on what their role is and what their duties and responsibilities are. Uh, so it's, it's going to be a, it's going to be a long trial among other things, back to the question of who's going to serve on the jury. Uh, people who are going to serve on the jury are going to have to commit themselves to being there for three or four or five weeks. And uh, that may pose a problem, and it poses a, a bigger problem in COVID. Uh, already, we've seen that uh, jury trials have been frozen since COVID. They're just resuming right now. And the first jury trial in Hennepin County resulted in the judge becoming test testing positive. So they stopped the jury trials for a while. They're trying to resume them. But it may be, depending upon what the COVID situation is next, you know, next March or next June, uh, it may be very difficult to find people who are saying, sure, I'll be happy to sit uh, in a jury box in a jury in a courtroom with uh, uh, hundreds of different people that I don't know for five weeks. Uh, listening to this case. So it may be hard just finding people who are willing to commit to being jurors. And if people are willing and commit to being jurors, then you start to wonder about why they want to, why they're so eager to be on the jury. So um, picking a jury here is going to be difficult, not only from a prejudice standpoint, not only from a bias. Yeah, I've seen the video. Uh, or it's going to be difficult to find jurors who are able and to, to be on a jury for five or four or five weeks, or depending upon where the trial is held. And it also may be difficult to find people who are able to, um, you know, um, be willing to uh, go through the, tr the the rigors of being a jury, a juror, and being subject to whatever happens to jurors after trials. The media has been asking the judge in the Noor case to release the names of the jurors, and the judge has been reluctant to do that. The media wants to interview the jury case, it's, even though it's been a couple of years. The media is going to want to really talk and find out who these jurors are and interview them and get their perspective. And and uh, some jurors may not want to, to be put in that role. There's one other factor I think that's worth mentioning too, and that's the Rodney King factor. As you recall, the LA riots that broke out in the Rodney King case, they didn't break, the, the LA riots did not occur at, when Rodney King was arrested in that video. The riots occurred when the officers were acquitted in the state court trial and the city blew up. Well, um, jurors, at least if the case is tried in, in Minneapolis, jurors are going to be under some pressure to, to realize that if they come back with a certain verdict, it may have certain repercussions on the community. And it also may have repercussions on them too. So people might not be all that eager to serve on this jury. So apart from the problems of finding unbiased jurors and people who are willing to serve five or six weeks and all of those other considerations, there may just be people who are reluctant to, to put themselves in a position of being jurors in this case, like you, Brian. So you're already, you've disqualified yourself already. Absolutely. But let me ask this question, who would like to? Is there anyone here who would say, you know, if I had a chance and all things being equal, I wouldn't mind being on a jury? A jury? <laughs> Not this jury. I said this jury. <laughs> this jury. Yeah. Marshall, are they going to restructure the jury box to be socially distanced? Who knows? I mean, yeah, that's the new code. Yeah, the new normal. I don't know what they've done. I think they've done that a little bit. And they've had a couple of jury trials now uh, as tests, and I think that's what they did. I don't know. I've had, I have several cases where we're supposed to have jury trials, but they're all from the, the, I, was, I had a hearing last week with a judge and they pushed our, our case was supposed to be tried in August and it's, it's going to be tried in a month. It starts with A now, but it's April, not August. So everything is kind of frozen right now. And the courts are not real eager to have jury trials. Have people traipsing through the courthouse and all this social distancing that has to be done. Who know, like I say, who knows what the situation will be uh, six or eight or nine months from once this hoax of the COVID virus goes away and the miracle happens and it disappears. Marshall, oh, yeah, uh, video. Oops. is there a chance that uh, uh, there was overcharging done in this case? You mentioned the toxicology report, yeah. given uh, the fact that those folks are saying the cause of death was not the officer's uh, right. act. Perhaps, you know, he was abusive. Might uh, he have been overcharged in this case? And can something be done to uh, reduce the charge to, to uh, come up with uh, uh, another offense? Well, as you know, there was a lot of discussion about that before the charges were brought, about what charge should be brought. Should it be first degree, second degree, third degree? And it certainly is not uncommon for prosecutors to overcharge. They, 
tend to want to throw the book at someone with the highest of charges they can that they think they can reasonably prove. So uh, it, there may be some overcharging here, and uh, it, 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 but uh, you know, a lesser included offense might be what assault and battery or something. I mean, that, that, that's probably not going to wash either in, in the eyes of the public. So I think ultimately, when it comes to trial time, it's kind of going to be all or nothing. It's either some some type of murder or not. I don't know if they can come up with some lesser charge like assault and battery or failure to uh, failure to carry out uh, duties or something like that. And, and I don't know that the public would countenance that either. And in most cases, as you know, 95, 90%, 90, 95% of all criminal cases end up in guilty pleas, plea bargains. Well, this case may be very difficult to have a plea bargain if for no other reason than because it's being undertaken in a fishbowl. And uh, while well, most cases uh, plea bargains can take place and no one pays a lot of attention to it, and they cut deals all the time. This case might be a real hard case to cut any deals by anybody, especially because the public is going to have a big say in what charges are ultimately agreed to by both sides. And I think from the prosecution standpoint, they're in it for the long haul. They got to try it to win it. And the defendants probably don't have a lot of room to maneuver to try to seek lesser charges because the prosecution probably won't accept a lesser charge plea. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for the questions. This was a great presentation, Marshall, and I have a feeling we could probably continue the dialogue for much, much longer. We're over our allotted time for Golden Valley Rotary. Um, so at this time, what I'd like us to do is recite the four-way test of the things we think, say, and do. And I'm going to pull it up on the screen here. First, yeah. is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? Four, will it be beneficial to all concerned? And with that, our club meeting is adjourned for the day. Thank you to all of our visitors, regulars, and of course, Mr. Tannock, it's always a pleasure to have you. Thank you for having me. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.